Hi, this is Axel from DreamSanctuary.net. In this video, we are going to study the Kabbalah Mineralis, an alchemical text, and see what psychological insights we can learn from it. Before we begin, I would like to recap some points from a previous video, Dream Series 07, where we discussed the redness, the rubedo, in some details. In that video, we said that the alchemical opus is made of three main stages. So the blackness, the nigredo, the whiteness, the albedo, and the redness, the rubedo. This model comes with two important caveats, the first one being that there are more operations, the putrefaction, the yellow, the green, the gold, and the blue. And the second caveat is that this order can vary greatly from text to text. So it's not impossible to find red, black, and white. In any case, there is this general observation that after the black, we need both the white and the red, so that there's a kind of inner chemical wedding that will create the son of the philosopher, the filius philosophorum, or the stone of the philosopher, the lapis philosophorum. In the text we're going to study, we'll see another description of how the stone appears after the white and out of the red. Let's turn to the Kabbalah Mineralis to illustrate those quite abstract points. The Kabbalah Mineralis is an old manuscript from the late 17th century, and the first book is made of seven double panels, so 14 illustrations. There is a second book, but we won't concern ourselves with it. If we look at this first double illustration, we see on the left a man gathering something. We can read Fodina near his hands, which means mines, or a place from which a mineral is dug. And on top of his head, we can read Mercury, which is the name of the base metal and primary substance of transformation for the alchemists. Therefore, we can say he is mining Mercury. On the right side, we see various elements being put together into a basin. And we can read the word Ponticitas, which refers to a water or liquid which dissolves substances, penetrating them and turning them into liquid. The technical word for ponticitas is vitriol. If we look closer, we see the man or the boy, and he's urinating inside the basin. This should be understood symbolically as the alchemist adding his own fertilizing essence to the mix. In any case, the right side of the illustration can be understood as gathering the prime matter, the prima materia, that is going to be subjected to the alchemical process. There are some more symbols on this page, for instance the birds, the fire and the sun, but those are recurring symbols, so we won't concern ourselves with them right now. I've said that this is a symbolic process and not a recipe to be taken literally. So how do we know that? If you read the text on the top right, and from the translation I found, it says, The mind of our mercury is all salpetre, not that of the vulgar. Our sharp bitter vitriol is not that of the vulgar. Our ammoniac is not that of the vulgar. So it should be clear that when the alchemist makes a distinction between the vulgar mercury and their mercury, they're not just talking about transforming matter. Something else is at play. So what is that other thing at play? I believe this quote from Jung clarify the topic. He says, For 15 years I studied alchemy, but I never spoke to anyone about it. I did not wish to influence my patients or my fellow workers by suggestion. But after 15 years of research and observation, ineluctable conclusions were forced upon me. The alchemical operations were real, only this reality was not physical, but psychological. Alchemy represents the projection of a drama, both cosmic and spiritual, in laboratory terms. The Opus Magnum had two aims, the rescue of the human soul and the salvation of the cosmos. What the alchemists called matter was in reality the unconscious self, the soul of the world, the anima mundi, which was identified with the spiritus mercurius, was imprisoned in matter. It is for this reason that the alchemists believe in the truth of matter, because matter was actually their own psychic life. 
but it was a question of freeing this matter, of saving it, in a word of finding the philosopher's stone, the corpus glorificationis. In summary, when we approach an alchemical text such as this one, we have to remember that this is the illustration of a psychological development whose language is matter. Everything is projected in matter. For instance, this first double page could be said to be the collection of the prima materia of base metals. But from a psychological perspective, what we are really doing is collecting raw unconscious contents from nature, the same way that dreams comes from nature. These raw unconscious contents are the mercury that we are going to transform from a low state to a higher state. Moving to the next double panel, once we've gathered the mercury, we have to prepare it. So the image on the top shows an Ouroboros with, written on top, the sprout of mercury and below it, hermaphrodite. And on the flask we read, mercury born in the form of a human being. The text says, the sprout of mercury, the water of life, nine volatile parts fix one part of mercury, homogenitas, the sharp living water. And the image below it shows a caduceus labeled living mercury and the text says our mercury the living pontic water if you are not used to alchemy and even if you are used to alchemy this is very difficult to understand but let's give it another chance first you have to remember the previous panel where the alchemist was mining the mercury and poured it with different elements into a basin and now this is represented as an Ouroboros in the same basin. This is in fact the same thing, it's just a different and new representation. In both cases, it's the undifferentiated prima materia in its totality, sometimes called the massa confusa. This explains why it has two labels, the seeds of mercury and hermaphrodite, because this Ouroboros is the yet to be transformed mercury shown in its cyclical and self-transforming aspect. On the same image, the Ouroboros is then put into a flask and it starts to look like a human being and it's labeled mercury in the form of a human being. It's heated in water and it moves to the next flask, which is now a caduceus, labeled the living mercury. All along we're dealing with mercury as the arcane substance that has different level of refinement. It started at the base metal, transformed many times over and reached the caduceus, which is the highest form that mercury can take. The caduceus is mercury at the conjunctio stage. It's the healing rod that can unite opposites. About this whole mercury thing, Jung writes, the principal symbol of the substance that is transformed during the process is mercurius. His portrait in the text agrees in all essentials with the characteristics of the unconscious. At the beginning of the process, he is in the massa confusa, the chaos, or nigredo. In this condition, the elements are fighting each other. Here, Mercurius plays the role of the prima materia, the transforming substance. He corresponds to the nous, or anthropos, sunk in physis, of Greek alchemy. In later days, he is also called the world soul in chains, a system of the higher powers in the lower, etc. This depicts a dark, unconscious condition of the adept or of a psychic content. These quotes really emphasize that the mercury that is transformed is really the unconscious from a raw element to a healing substance. To achieve this transformation, we have to prepare the mercury and those illustrations tell us that we need three things. It needs to be heated, it needs to be emergent water, and it needs to be sealed. Fire is easy to explain. It's the libido, it's the passion, the affects, the desires, emotions, anything that drives human nature. Water, as usual, is a connection to the unconscious. That means that the psyche cannot be transformed merely from the standpoint of ego consciousness. We need a continuous connection to the unconscious. And the ceiling, it's done to avoid psychological contagion and outside influence. And you do that by sealing the psyche into a closed vessel. 
You can understand this vessel as the crucible of therapy or analysis, if we omit the problem of transferences or counter-transferences. Or you could see it as physical isolation, which has its own risks. In any case, the sealing is done to avoid impurities that would contaminate the transformation process. Now that we've gathered the mercury and prepared it, there's going to be a series of transformation until the end goal is reached. According to this manuscript, it's going to look like this. And we're going to look at each step separately, but first let's use color coding to give a sense of which transformations are taking place. It starts on the third double panel, and we have two stages of blackness, the nigredo. On the fourth panel on the left, we still have the blackness, but this time it's going to be a putrefaction. It moves to the green stage, which is named viriditas, and then we have two stages of the white, the albedo or the omnus colorus, which is still the white stage, but it has a different name. At the bottom, on the left panel of the double illustration, there's an operation that I don't really know how to name, so I've tentatively said that it is a pre-rubedo, because it's going to move into the rubedo and move into another version of the rubedo on the 7, and the final stage is going to be the lapis sophorum, which is the stone of the wise. And if I had to give it a color, despite its red nature, I would say that this is the gold stage. So let's go through each double illustration, one after the other. We start with the black stage, the nigredo, and the text says, two to more than three parts of our mercury dissolve one part of the common moon or sun, and they become inseparably one sponges, porous body, which is called our moon or sun, not the common. The moon through mercury of five eagles, the sun through mercury of seven eagles. And the image at the bottom has no text, but there's still something we can read on the image that says the Sophic calcination of the sun. Let's try to understand this. If we looked at the winged angel in the flask, around its belly, it has a moon on the left and a sun on the right. According to the text, we are trying to dissolve the common sun and the common moon into the liquid. So what does this mean? In alchemy, we are usually dealing with the problem of opposites and they're personified with Sol and Luna, so Sun and Moon. But sometimes they're also represented as royal spouses, like a king and a queen. And there is this intuition that for these opposites to be reunited together, it has to be dissolved through Mercury. Here's an example from the secret book of Artifius. Dissolve then Sol and Luna in our dissolving water, which is familiar and friendly, and the next in nature unto them, and as it were a womb, a mother, an original, the beginning and the end of their life. And because Sol and Luna have their origin from this water, their mother, it is necessary therefore that they enter into it again, to wit into their mother's womb, that they may be regenerate or born again, and made more healthy, more noble and more strong. If we turn to Jung, we can translate this into a psychological language. And Jung writes, The feminine character of the lapis albus corresponds to that of the unconscious, symbolized by the moon. The sun corresponds to the light of consciousness. Becoming conscious of an unconscious content amounts to its integration in the conscious psyche and is therefore a conjunctio solis et lunae. This process of integration is one of the most important helpful factors in modern psychotherapy, which is preeminently concerned with the psychology of the unconscious, for both the nature of consciousness and that of the unconscious are altered by it. The way I see those two illustrations is that we have to take the common moon, which is a raw content of the unconscious, and the common sun, which is a raw content of consciousness, and both of them will be altered by an integrative work. Now you could ask, what's the deal with those five or seven eagles? And I found this quote in Adam McLean's study course on alchemical sequences that says that birds were often used to reflect the idea of rising up and returning again in a controlled way. Thus, some alchemists, 
especially in the 17th century, used the term eagle to refer to a circulation through volatilization and condensation. And in psychology and alchemy, we find the illustration that says, eagle a symbol of the spirit ascending from the prima materia. So the way I understand eagles is that it's a symbol of the spiritualization of matter, which has to happen many times over in a cyclical manner. It does not just take place once, and this is why we have five or seven eagles. Moving on to the next image, we go to the putrefactio and the viriditas. So our liquid, in which the common sun and the common moon was dissolved, was black, but it was porous. And so the putrefaction brings this liquid into a state of not being porous. And if this goes well, at some point the black color will become green by itself. So what does this mean? The idea here is that for the transformation to succeed, it must be fully black with no asperities. And you can think that it's the same with ourselves. It's only when we can no longer escape or distract ourselves away from the blackness, only when we are cornered with it, that we can really start transmuting what's at hand. And if that transmutation is successful, the text tells us that the liquid is going to move from black to green. And the green has been commented on by Jung. He writes, it is the alchemical Benedicta Viriditas, the blessed greenness, signifying on the one hand the leprosy of the metals, but on the other the secret immanence of the divine spirit of life in all things. Green signifies hope and the future, but in alchemy, green also means perfection. The next double panel is the albedo and omnis colores, many colors. So we are moving from the green into a white grainy substance named the white sulfur. But it has to be melted again until the liquid shows those many colored vapors resembling the tail of a peacock. Here we really have three keywords. We have the white, the many colors and the peacock's tail. With that, we know that we've reached a milestone in the process and the black has been fully transformed to the white, to the albedo. Here is what Jung says about the white as this intermediary stage in the opus. From this, the washing either leads direct to the whitening or else the soul, released at the death, is reunited with the dead body and brings about its resurrections. Or again, the many colors, omnes colores, or peacock's tail, lead to the one white color that contains all colors. At this point, the first main goal of the process is reached, namely the albedo, tinctura alba, terra alba foliata, lapis albus, etc., highly prized by many alchemists as if it were the ultimate goal. It is the silver or moon condition which still has to be raised to the sun condition. The albedo is, so to speak, the daybreak, but not till the rubedo is its sunrise. The transition to the rubedo is formed by the citrinitas, though this, as we have said, was omitted later. The rubedo then follows direct from the albedo as the result of raising the heat of the fire to its highest intensity. As we realize, the process is not over and we have to move to the red. So from our liquid with these colored vapors looking like the peacock's tail, we have to proceed through a volatilization through dryness. So the liquid is dried and it's dried until we get red grains. This is the red sulfur and as the text says, by this the dawn gradually vanishes, our sun rises in beautiful and most red grains, and our red sulfur by the wise so desired, which however is not the end of the work. What is this red condition, and how is it different from the white? If we conceptualize the opus as a process of daybreak, the albedo, the white stage, moving towards sunrise, the redness, the rubedo, we have a kind of illumination coming from the unconscious and also consciousness. This is what Jung says about this illumination. The illumination comes to a certain extent from the unconscious, since it is mainly dreams that put us on the track of enlightenment. This dawning light corresponds to the albedo, the moonlight, which in the opinion of some alchemists, heralds the rising sun. The growing redness, which now follows denotes an increase of warmth and light coming from the sun, consciousness. 
This corresponds to the increasing participation of consciousness, which now begins to react emotionally to the contents produced by the unconscious. At first, the process of integration is a fiery conflict, but gradually it leads over to the melting or synthesis of the opposites. The alchemists termed this the rubedo, in which the marriage of the red man and the white woman, Sol and Luna, is consummated. The idea here is that there's a form of consciousness, a form of light in the unconscious, but it cannot be grasped, it cannot be understood by the ego unless there's a kind of conscious participation. And so that's the difference between the white, which was passive, into the red, which is active. We've reached the red stage, but as the text says, this is not the end of the work. We still have to go through another transformation. This transformation of the red sulfur is an imbibition of the stone. And so it requires seven separate imbibitions and it has to be done through one month until we reach the final illustration, which is labeled the stone of the wise, the medicine of the third order. And the text says, a month having been completed, the omnipotent king or our stone arises, the perfect medicine of the third order in its projection able to transmute all metals. This last operation of imbibition is a slow and careful process where the red liquid has to be gradually absorbed. It cannot be rushed. It has to be done almost drip by drip. And this has to be done for one month by rotating the wheel of nature. The text also mentioned that a putrefaction is taking place at the same time. So if everything goes well, at the end, the omnipotent king arises and decided that the king appears, which is also a transformation of the sun, means that we're really dealing with a transformation of consciousness from a barren, decaying state to a new redemptive state. And that's the medicine, and that's the end of the opus. So that's it. That's the whole operation from beginning to end to get the medicine of the third order. And as the name implies, the stone is achieved with three distinct heating, three distinct calcinations, which means we have to heat it three times in a row without opening the flasks. Let's review these calcinations. The first calcination is moving from black to the white. So we have to dissolve the common moon, dissolve the common sun, get one inseparable non-porous body in the putrefaction stage, and at some point the black body will turn green and finally display white grains. So that's the first milestones, that's the albedo. And as we said, it's a kind of passive, vegetative life essence. The second calcination is moving from white to the red. So the white is melted again into a liquid until we see the colored vapors. And then that liquid is dried again until the red grains appear. That's the second milestones, that's the rubedo. And we've described it as a kind of living life essence. And the third and final calcination is moving from the red to the lapis. And this is a slow and careful process of imbibitions for one month until the lapis appears, which is the stone, the king, and the medicine. These three milestones can also be described from a psychological perspective, and I'll do my best to try to present them. The first milestone is the albedo, and I would describe this as discovering the reality of the unconscious and we know that it responds to us, that it gives us things and those are important, but the ego still maintains an aesthetic attitude towards them. So we have a dream and we kind of don't do anything with it. We know it's important, but we just leave it on the side. Maybe we have a synchronicity and we are surprised by it, but we don't work on figuring out the meaning of the synchronicity. The second stage would be the rubedo, and now the ego really starts to be morally engaged with the unconscious. Or you could say that the blood of the self flows to the ego and the ego is responding to it. So the ego is morally and emotionally engaged in the process of the unconscious. We take dreams seriously, we act on them, we calibrate our attitude, and so on and so forth. And the final stage, which would be the lapis, well, I don't really know what this is, but I can guess that this process of potential 
in the unconscious into actualization, into consciousness, would be instantaneous and embodied and fully responsive. And the idea is that every time the unconscious has something to say to the ego, the ego would realize it. And every time the ego does something, the unconscious would respond to it. And so the process would be continuous. It would be like living in the constant state of synchronicity. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. Anyway, that's just a guess. We finally reached the end of this video, and so I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope this clarifies how alchemy should be approached and that, despite how confusing and difficult the material is, there are really wonderful things to discover if we put some time and effort into it.